under this curve are three million observations. <clears throat> and let's say that um, when we calculated the mean, and mu was the population mean, um, let's say it was uh, 72 minutes. Okay, so we um, contacted or took uh, 3 million observations, calculated the mean, it came up to 72 uh, minutes. And we'll say that sigma, which is the standard deviation of the population, let's say that that was uh, 10 minutes. Okay, so the mean and the standard deviation come from the 3 million uh, people that uh, commute to work. Here's the distribution. And so if we were to look at distribution and we were to plot a few points on this curve right here, this would be 72 minutes because it's the mean. It's in the middle, it's also the median and the bone. If I were to go one standard deviation to the right, how many minutes are we talking about here? If I go one standard deviation to the right, so it would be mu plus sigma. This would be mu. This would be mu plus one sigma. And what's sigma? Ten minutes. And so these observations over here would be how many minutes? 82. So these would be 82 minutes. If I go one standard deviation to the left, so this would be mu minus one sigma, this would be what, 62 minutes. If I went two standard deviations to the right, if I went mu plus two sigma, this would be 92. And if I went mu minus two sigma, this would be uh, 60, 52. Okay, as I said, uh, all we did here was just plot some points along the curve. So, if I were to ask the question, we will just get rid of these here for a moment. Here's the question, what percentage uh, commute between 62 minutes And uh, now let's change it to 63. We'll say 63 minutes and uh, 81 minutes. So there's the question. And so where's 63 on this curve? Here's 63 right here. 81 is right here. And so we're looking for uh, the area between 63 and 81. And so the question is, what's the area under the curve between 63 and 81 given a normal distribution when mu is equal to 72 and sigma is equal to 10? So how do you find the area under the normal curve? And so that's what chapter seven is pretty much all about. And the way we do it is, is we go from the X scale to the Z scale. And Z in this case is equal to X minus mu divided by sigma. Okay? So if we were to convert 72 to the Z scale, what would it be? Well, it would be 72 minus mu. What's mu? 72. What's 72 minus 72? 0 divided by sigma, 10. What's 0 divided by 10? This would be a 0 on the z scale. How about the values that are one standard deviation to the right? What's the z score here? It's 82 minus mu. What's mu? 72. What's 82 minus 72? 10 divided by sigma, 10. What's 10 divided by 10? Plus 1. So 82 would be plus 1, 92 would be a plus 2, because it would be 92 minus 72, which is 20, divided by 10, which is 2. Over here, what's 62? 62 minus 72 is minus 10. What's minus 10 divided by 10? This is a minus 1. And if you go two standard deviations to the left, what do you think this z is over here? Minus 2. Minus two. So uh, what we've done here is, is we have um, 
One, two, three, four, five reference points on the X scale converted to the Z scale. And so uh, what I tell students is, is that when I do a problem, if it's related to something like this, I always put in the reference points because it's pretty easy. What you do is you go to the mean, you go one standard deviation to the right, two standard deviations to the right, one standard deviation to the left, two standard deviations to the left. And it's always going to be zero, plus one, plus two, minus one, and minus two on the Z scale. And the reason why I do that is, is because it's going to give you a hint as to what the answer is before you even get it. Because right now you know that 63, okay, when converted to the Z, is going to be less than minus one. And, uh, I'm sorry, more than minus one because we're on this side. And 81 would be less than 1.0. All right, so we know we're going to be looking for the area under the curve between z equals something greater than minus 1 through z equals something less than my, uh, plus 1. And so if we were to convert 63 and 81 to the z, what would it be? It would be 63 minus 72 divided by 10. And so... 63 minus 72 is minus, uh, what's that, minus 9 divided by 10. So this would be a minus 0 0.90 on the Z scale. That relates to 63 minutes. 81 minutes would be 81 minus 72 over 10 which is 9 divided by 10, which is a plus 0 0.90. So now we know that <clears throat> from a Z-scale basis, we're going to look for the area between minus 0 0.90 and plus 0 0.90. On the X-scale basis, we're looking for the area under the curve between 63 and 81 minutes. Okay? So once you go from the X-scale to the Z-scale, the Z scale is the standard scale, and with the standard scale, there's a table in the book. And so things are a lot easier when you have a table in the book. And so the table that we use is uh, on the back flap, areas under the normal curve. It's also uh, I don't know, one of the appendices. So this, this table appears twice in the textbook. And uh, remember that the table reads this way. Okay, 0 0.4750 is the shaded area. Okay, mm -hmm. so if one were to ask, well, we don't want the shaded area, we want the area in this tail over here. What would the area be in this tail? What would the area be in this tail? 0 0.0250. It would, well, what's the area to the right of zero? 0.5, correct? And so if 0.475 here, this area here would be 0 0.5000 0, 0, 0 minus 0 0.4750. This would be 0 0.0250. Because 0 0.0250 plus 0 0.4750 equals 0 0.5. Okay? So this area right here is 0 0.0250 at 1.96. So that's how you read the table. Over back to this problem over here, where it says, oh, well, we're going to look up 0 0.90. So when you go to the table and you look up 0 0.9, and then you go over to the first column, because that's the 0 0.00 column. So what do you see as the area under the curve between z equals 0 and z equals 0 0.90? 0 0.3159. Okay? So, if one were to look at this curve right here, remembering that the point 3159 is the area from zero out to the Z. Okay? So the point 3159 is the area from zero out to the Z. So only this part right here is point 3159. We still have another area under the curve that we have to look up. And so when you convert this, you see the 0 0.90 again. Go to get the table to be the same area. And so this would be 0 0.3159. And so what's the area under the curve between minus 0 0.9 and 
and plus 0 0.9 on the Z scale or between 63 and 81 minutes, the area under the curve is what? You just add the two up. What's it? 0.6218. Uh, Is that right? Is it 6218? 62, 60, oh, 6318. Oh, another thing. If anybody has a calculator, you have to help me out a little bit on some of these. Instead of me having to uh, slow things down and go to. Uh, uh, 63, yeah, 6318. Okay, so <clears throat> in answer to the question, what percentage can you between 63 minutes and 81 minutes? What's the answer? 63.18 percent, or 0.6318 on a decimal basis. Everybody follow that? Okay, pretty straightforward. This is like the last thing that you should have learned in Stat One: area under the normal distribution. Okay, so um, let's say that uh, this exists, this distribution exists, but you don't know it. And somebody says to you, I want you to go out there and I want you to select one commuter at random, just one. My question to you would be, what's the probability that that commuter travels between 63 and 81 minutes? When you go out there and you randomly select that one commuter, the probability that that commuter travels between 63 and 81 minutes is 0.6318. Okay. Why? Because how many commuters are under this, this curve here? Three million. And what percentage of them are between 63 and 81? 6318. So how many commuters is that? It's 0 0.6318 times 3 million. So there's a bundle of them out there. And so the probability that you get one of them is going to be 6318. Okay? okay. So this is the uh, distribution of commuters. And so in statistics what we do is we don't have time and we don't have the money to survey three million commuters to determine the time that they commute to, to work. And so what we do in statistics is we take a sample. <clears throat> and when we take a sample, we open ourselves up to error. And so we recognize that when we take a sample, we open ourselves up to error. But because of probability, there's going to be a good chance that our sample is going to yield good, st good statistics. And so um, we begin chapter 8 in the textbook, and it's entitled Sampling and the Central Limit Down. How do you randomly sample from the population? And so uh, if you look at the text, Oh, one, oh, another thing, the, um, uh, the quizzes, the homework, and the, uh, in, uh, the final exam in class, it's all open book, okay? You can use anything you want to get you the answer. The only thing you cannot use is somebody else, okay? So bring in your notes, bring in your books, bring in your Excel. You can even use Excel if you want, <coughs> because that says to me that if you're going to use Excel, you had better understand it when it gives you an answer. Because I give partial credit on examples, meaning that if for some reason you said two and two is five, and then you used the five and you got the wrong answer because you added incorrectly, if I can find it, I will only take off a, a minimal amount of points because I figured that everybody knows how to add two and two. However, if you just give me the answer and it's wrong, I can't give you any uh, I can't give you partial credit because I have no idea how you got it. And uh, one thing about this class is it's statistics, it's based on probability. So basically, when in doubt, take a guess. Because it might be your lucky day. You might get the right answer. 
And if you get the right answer, and remember, that's all I'm going to look for on the test. I'm going right to the answer. If that answer is right, I don't care how you got it. I'm moving on. Because I say, what's the likelihood that they guess right? It's probably like almost impossible. However, hey, it was their lucky day. So um, now, if you get the answer wrong, what I do is, is I go back and I try to find out how you derive the answer. And if I can find where you went wrong, then I make a decision as to how much partial credit I give. Um, and as I said, if it's only an arithmetic error, I pretty much give you the whole thing, even though the answer's wrong. Uh, so um, when you do submit homework and when you do submit the test, make sure you give me all the backup too, because I, I, I'm okay. I've been doing it for such a long time that I'm okay at finding where students go wrong. You should see some of the things I get as it relates to neatness and things of that nature. I'm not into neatness, as you probably see as this head right on the board throughout the course. Um, so sub submit everything that you think uh, I'll need to help me understand as to how you got, got the answer. Okay, so we had a question, I'm sorry. Um, the PowerPoints that are posted online, are, there, are they derived directly from the book? The problems, the, the homework? No, the PowerPoint um, that has like explanations. I was looking at it online. Yeah, there's two, uh, there's two postings. One is a PowerPoint from the book. The book actually has its own PowerPoint presentation. And then what, what's also up there is, is I've consolidated it and put it into uh, even a, a shorter presentation <coughs> in, in PowerPoint. The book is nice and colorful. Their presentation mine's a little dry and black and white. But um, the examples in the uh, presentations are uh, yeah, they're probably similar to what you might get on a homework assignment or, or on the uh, final exam. Okay, so if you do well on the homework, uh, you should do you know, fairly well on the, on the final because uh, the problems are basically similar. So, uh, okay, so uh, we move over to chapter eight and it's entitled The uh, Sampling Met Methods in the Central Limit Theorem. And there's a bunch of definitions in here and how you sample and things of that nature. And so, like I said, my, my tests are open book. So you really don't have to memorize anything, but you have to understand what the book is saying. Okay, and so they talk about uh, a random sample. It says here a sample selected so that each item or person in the population has the same chance of being included. And so that's very important. In order to have a random sample, each observation in the population has to have an equally likely chance of being chosen. If they're not equally likely, then you, you have a biased sample and biased samples give you biased results. And biased results give you biased statistics. And biased statistics give you biased estimates. So it's very important that when you sample, your sample be a random sample. And so if you're interested in three million commuters, each one of them has to have an equally likely chance of being chosen. And once they are chosen, you have to find them. Whoever that may be, if you're going to choose a hundred observations from three million, you have to hunt those people down. <clears throat> and that's why sampling is so expensive and so time consuming. Doing statistics and the tests and the estimates takes like no time at all. You plug the data in and if you have Excel or whatever it is you're using, you probably get the answer in four minutes. And so most of the time is, is in inputting the data, which may take you, if you have 100 observations, I was going to take you five minutes to put data in, depending on what the data is. The only problem is it can take you weeks and sometimes months and sometimes years to get the 100 observations. And so statistics is very expensive because of sampling. And so what you do in statistics is, as, as I've said in stat one, when you go to do any statistical study, your first two questions are as follows. How much time and money do you have? Before you do anything, how much time and money do you have? Because you know that sampling is very expensive. And when they answer how much time and money, then you say, <clears throat> how much error can you live with? An error, as we'll see in statistics, is anywhere from one 
to 5 to 10 percent. And you get to select error. You also get to select sample size too, but it's always a function of whatever the person who's paying for, whatever their budget is, that's pretty much um, how much you sample for. In statistics, the adage is the bigger the sample, the better the statistic most of the time, meaning that if you can sample more people, the error decreases. You'll see it in a formula that we put up over the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> and so that's why we say the bigger the sample, the better the statistic. Really what we're saying is the bigger the sample, the tighter the interval if you have a confidence interval, or less as it uh, less error as it comes to a uh, level of significance and things of that nature. So um, okay, so this is this sampling.